Hey, guess what, man? I love this truth, all right? God never wastes a hurt. Nothing is ever wasted in God's economy. Any valley that you go through in life will equip you to minister to others who go through similar valleys in their lives. This is awesome. In this fourth part of this series called Recover, we're going to learn that we're not fully recovered until we come to the place that we can actually use our recovery experience in ministry to others. Here we go. Hey man, I'm Pastor Brad, and just in case we haven't met, let me introduce myself, okay? I'm an 80s-style Christian metal musician, and I'm a teaching pastor. That means that I love to create music of that 80s flair, the 80s style, that will rock you up in your faith, and I love to teach the Word of God in a way that hopefully will really build you up in your walk with Jesus, okay? If that sounds like something that would be a blessing to you, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. Here in just a minute, I'm going to drop the audio to this message in. I won't be coming back at the end of the message to close it out, so I want to be sure and say right here that if you like the video, be sure to click the like button, grab the link to the video, and share it with your friends on social media. And leave a comment because I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to interact with you. All right, man, once again, I'm so glad you're here. Let's get into this. Let's learn how we can come through a dark valley in our life and recover from it and then Come to that place of experiencing full recovery by actually allowing God to use what he's taught us in our valleys to bless someone else and help them recover. Let's do it. Job is the pinnacle of recovery. Nobody in this room has more to recover from than Job. I can't imagine any of us ever having more to recover from than Job did. Listen, let me just recap the story real quick for you. If you haven't read it lately, it opens up in chapter 1 with God meeting with the angels in this kind of celestial setting. And Satan actually appears. And God says, where, where have you been? What have you been doing? And he says, oh, I've been roaming to and fro throughout the earth. And he says, well, have you considered my servant Job? He's upright. There's nothing unrighteous in him. He said, well, yeah, you bless him. Of course he loves you. Let me have a whack at him. Paraphrasing, of course. This is the, the BHW version. And God says, all right, but don't touch him. So within a matter of a day, Job has 10 children. And all of them die in one tragic event. All of them die in an instant. Can you imagine that? I mean, I've, I've been around families that have lost a child, and it's overwhelming. He lost his entire, all of his children in one event. Wealth was measured in herds and, and possessions. And, and Job had herds of sheep and goats and and cattle and, and camels and all of them, and including all of the servants who overlooked them, you know, watched over them, were destroyed or taken by enemies in a day. All of this. He lost his family and everything he owned. And a little later then, God even gave Satan freedom to not take his life, but afflict his body with sores. So he ends up, in a matter of about 48 hours, having lost everything, sitting in the dust in ashes with boils all over his body. He's lost everything except for his wife, and all she does is nag him. That's all she does. And here's the pinnacle of Job's wife's pep talk. Chapter 2, we're just at the beginning of the story after he's lost everything. Verse 9, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Are you still trying to give praise to God? Come on, curse God and die. Thanks, honey. I mean, think about it. Yeah, that's what I needed to hear right now. I don't even, we can't, we can't. We can't even begin to put ourselves in his shoes. I mean, we can just mentally try to wrap around what it would feel like to lose everything in a day like that and then to have our spouse say, oh, just curse God and die. Brutal. And then Job had these three friends who come when they hear about his tragedy. They come to comfort him, air quotes. And they come, and the first week that they spend with Job is awesome. I mean, it's not that things get better, but they do the right thing. Because you know what they say to Job that first week? Nothing. They just sit with him in quiet. That's good. That's good. Because, listen, here's a little tip. If you ever find yourself 
in a spot where you're trying to console someone who's really going through a tragedy or lost someone that they loved, here's the tip. The deeper the pain, the fewer words you use. That is really worth writing down, okay? The deeper the pain, the fewer words you use. So, if they're having a bad hair day, you can talk about that a lot, okay? Yeah, I can't believe they cut it like that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess that product's not really working for you. I'm sorry that it's not doing what it ought to do. And you can just join in with them and commiserate, and that's all okay. Bad hair day. Talk all afternoon. But when they've lost their spouse, when they've lost their child, here's, here's what you need to do. Show up and shut up. That's it. You know, just be there. It's called the ministry of presence. Just the ministry of presence, just being in proximity. You showing up and just being there with them speaks volumes. More than words could ever speak and really probably in a better way. Uh, they don't need your words. They just need your presence. When people are hurting, when people are experiencing tragedy, they don't need a sermon. They just need a hug. Right? They just need someone to be there for them. But Job's friends, after a week, they begin to think they've got this whole thing figured out. They think they know what Job's problem is. And so they decide they want to try to set Job straight because what they've figured out is that Job must have done something wrong. It must be Job's sin, right? God is, God's not going to be like this. God's not going to allow this to come into the life of someone that's a good person. So you must be bad on some level. Something must have happened. And so for 35 or so chapters of Job, Job's friends banter and talk incessantly and share all this philosophy and, and theology. And it's very poetic and it sounds, you know, kind of grand. But it's a bunch of garbage. For 35 chapters, it's like, Job, you must have done something wrong. You must have sinned. There must be some problem. You must have done this. You must have done that. Because God doesn't do this to good people. And Job would respond and say, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I haven't done anything wrong. And it's mixed with Job just wailing before God and crying out. And he goes through all the emotions of anger and, 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 and struggle and, and fear. And I mean, he, he opens up by saying, I wish the day that I had been born would just be wiped from the calendar. Why did it even have to happen? Why couldn't I have been a stillborn? Then I could be resting with my fathers. I wouldn't have had to, this day wouldn't have had to come. I mean, he just pours his heart out. He rails against God. He never speaks disrespectfully or untruthfully, but he just, he just lets it fly. For 30 some chapters this goes on. And then God speaks to Job. God breaks the silence. And if you read through the book, it's an amazing dramatic shift in chapter 38. God opens his mouth after silence of all this time. And he opens it by saying, Job, I will speak to you. And you will listen to me. And then he begins to speak. And he begins to Communicate this message of, I'm the potter, you're the clay. This is my world. I spoke it into existence. I spoke the word and the sun, moon, and stars came into being. I know all of their names. They sing my praises. Job, do they sing your praises? Job, I've walked along the depths, the deepest, darkest portions of the floor of the, of the, of the oceans. Have you been there? Have you seen that? I know where darkness and light reside. I can take you there. Can you take me there? The lightning reports to me and says, where should we go? I know where the storehouses of snow are. Now, all this stuff. It just, it just, all of his, his, he just reveals his sovereignty, his, his, his limitless power, his limitless knowledge to Job. And when it's all said and done, he doesn't answer any of Job's questions about why. But he so reveals himself in such a mighty way to Job. And Job gets such a sense of who God is that he is humbled and at peace with just resting in God. A powerful, powerful lesson to learn. And then in chapter 42, God turn, turns his attention to Job's friends. <laughs> 
And he says here in chapter 42, verse 7, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, that's one of Job's friends, I am angry with you and with your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me the same way Job did. I want you to make a sacrifice. And listen to this next statement. This is so huge. And Job will pray for you. I want you to feel that, okay? Job, this guy that you have gone on and 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 on about, about how he must be broke, how he must be the bad one, how he must be a sinner, how he must be the one that's struggling. Guess what? That guy is going to pray for you. Okay? Then, when he prays for you, I will answer his prayer and I won't disgrace you the way you deserve. So they did as the Lord asked them to do. And the Lord answered Job's prayer. Now get this next part. This is massive. When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored Job's health and prosperity. I, I, I want you to like underline that, highlight that, think about that. When, this is a timing issue. When Job prayed for his friends... The Lord restored Job's health and his prosperity. And Job recovered twice as much as he had before his pain. Job did not experience recovery when he, when he prayed for himself. Job experienced recovery when he prayed for his friends. That is really powerful for us to see at the end of this series. Here's the lesson. Our recovery is only complete when we pray for the recovery of others. Do you see that? Do you get that? Our recovery is only complete when we come to the place where we can pray for others. My hope for you through this whole series, if you've been here, is that you see how inseparably linked prayer and recovery are. But we really don't experience true recovery without turning to the Lord in faith and repentance. This is why faith and repentance are so key in this, because it's, you got to come clean. The only way out is through. You come clean, faith, repentance, you lay your heart before the Lord, say, Lord, cleanse me, make me new, make me, you know, I'm turning to you, I'm turning away from anything I need to, behaviorally, attitudinally, whatever, that I know of, I'm laying it in your heart, hands, I'm turning away from it, I'm giving it to you, God will restore you. You know you're restored when you can then begin to say, it's not about me anymore. I can turn my attention and my energy to praying for others. Lord, I want to be in your hands. I want to be used by you now to make a difference. That's when you know you've come through the tunnel. There are all kinds of examples of recovery in the Bible. Genesis chapter 38 verse 12. Judah recovered from his grief. Genesis 45 27. Joseph recovered from his shock. 1 Samuel 30 Verses uh, 18 and 19, David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken from him, his family, and everything valuable to him. In the book of Judges, Samson recovered his strength one last time and took out the Philistines. After their exile of 70 years, Israel recovered the promised land. In 1 Kings, Elijah recovered his courage after he'd run away. And again, in 2 Samuel, David recovered a pure heart after his affair with Bathsheba when he prayed and surrendered that to the Lord. All of these verses teach us that God is indeed a God of recovery. Praise the Lord. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with. If it's a vision issue, if it's a physical issue, if it's a an addiction, I don't know. I mean, it could be all kinds of things. It could be fear, it could be guilt, it could be shame, it could be all kinds of things. Turn to the Lord. Lay it before Him. Say, Lord, search my heart. Is there anything in my life I need to turn away from? Am I walking in a pattern? I need to walk away from the way I think, the way I'm living, whatever. Lay it before the Lord. Confess it. Say, Lord, I'm turning to You. And You can recover from whatever it is you're dealing with. And 
God will bring you through that tunnel to the point where it's not just about you praying for you, but you can say, Lord, I now I'm hungry. I'm hungry to pray for my neighbors, for my family. There, there are members of my family who don't know you, who aren't living for you, who aren't in this room today, who could be in this room today. You know, there are members of my, my coworkers, people I work with, who I, I, I don't see any signs of faith or love for you in them. They, they seem very much outside the family of God. Lord, I'm praying for them. You know, to be moved to that place where it's not just, I need, I need, pray for me. But no, God has restored me and I'm ready to be used by him to lift others up. The gospel is a search and recovery mission. And it calls people out of brokenness and brings healing to their life and makes us whole so that we can then join the recovery mission for others. So, where are you in this process today? Is there some brokenness going on? Is there something you're afraid of? Some hump you can't get over? Some mountain you just keep walking around over and over again? Some attitude? Some struggle in your heart? Some relationship? I don't know. Then you're like, you know what? I, I, I'm not to that place where it's not about me anymore. I'm, I'm still all focused on my stuff. And I need the Lord to help me get past that. Whatever that is, lay that down. Now, now, let's just be honest. It's an ongoing process. It's not like you're like, okay, I, I got past all that and for the rest of my life I'm good. I get it. There's going to be times you return and say, Lord, I need, I need healed again. I need recovered again. I, you know, that, that's going to happen. You continue to walk with the Lord and all of that. But I mean, in general, the pattern of your life, are you at that place where you're ready to say, Lord, I'm ready to pour out? not just be poured into. Maybe there's someone here today, and I think about this all the time. Maybe there's someone here today, and you're like, man, I've done church forever. I heard about God all my life. But if someone point blank just honestly looked at me and said, tell me when you accepted Jesus as your Savior and turned away from your old life and put Jesus on the throne of your heart, and you became a follower of Jesus, and now you wake up every day saying, Lord, you're my king. I can't say that I can remember a time I ever did that. Well, maybe today's the day God would say, hey, let's enter the recovery process. Let's come and say, Lord, I'm putting you on the throne of my heart today. I want to follow you as my Lord. Today would be the day to do that. Because that's where it starts. That would be awesome. So how do spiritually hungry res our disciples respond? Well, I think one of the real important lessons we can pull out of this is an awareness that the trouble that comes into our life isn't always because we did something wrong. We used to live in a broken world. This isn't heaven yet. And so sometimes the brokenness of this world just interacts with our life, period. And sickness comes, and pain comes, and loss comes, and hardship comes. Sometimes bad things just happen to good people. And we just kind of need to embrace that and look to Job and say, you know what? He was a righteous man. But that doesn't mean God's abandoned us or that God doesn't love us. And we can turn to him and we can trust him. And when we turn to him, we can recover. And the pinnacle of our recovery is when we move beyond just getting our needs met. But now we can turn and pray for our friends. Pray for others who need to experience recovery in their life. I pray that wherever you are, whether it's I need to come accept Christ or I'm ready, I need to be healed today of this, I need to recover, or Lord, I need to be called beyond me to be praying for others and pouring out. I pray we'll say yes to the Holy Spirit today. Let's pray.